Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to the Sherlock Conversations. My name is Don Smith, and I am your host. Folks, we have a first today. This is an official first, and there is nobody better to this, than to celebrate this first with than um, a person that the Sherlock Conversations considers a friend, Bonnie McBird. Bonnie, we are here talking about your... Uh, book Unquiet Spirits your latest Sherlock Holmes novel but can I tell you what our first is today yeah what is it you are our first three Pete interview you <laughs> have officially been given the triple crown interview oh cool that's fun <laughs> so thank Thanks. you so much for being here for three times now oh excellent well thank you thank I, you for having me and I hope we can have uh, three times, three times, three times you coming back. So as long as you're writing books, we will have you back as much as we possibly can. Well, thank you. And let me say this for the record, even non-Sherlock books, we will have you back. Oh, well, thank you. I'm, yeah, I'm enjoying the, the writing. I, um, I'm working on book three right now. <laughs> Are you really? Okay. Yes. So, all yes. right. I wanted to talk about that, but let's, let's talk real quick about Unquiet Spirits. Unquiet Spirits, I remember talking about this the last time. In fact, I remember I was interviewing you. I was sitting downstairs in a basement. I was staying at my mother-in-law's temporarily. And my wife and I just recently moved to Pennsylvania and I have my own office and I'm interviewing you from that office now. Okay. Nice. So, so this is really cool. And I remember you telling me about Unquiet Spirits and about how it was a combination of ghosts and whiskey and some other things. So. And so now it is, I'm holding it in my hand. We are about, uh, let me see, this is due out October 10th, which is just in time for the month, for the month of October. Uh, we get all spooky, a little bit more Halloween, and we kind of pull back the veil between us and the world of the unseen. So this is fantastic that you get to do this. Well, thanks. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it was fun. It's definitely, Unquiet Spirits refers to, uh, to ghosts, obviously, but it, it also refers to whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Now, one of the things that I also kind of, that I find interesting, and, and it's, and it's a subject that I've talked about before. Um, Watson is quoted as saying that Holmes is probably the most logical man he's ever met. I think he used a term like the most uh, logician or logical person like Holmes used logic from Watson's perspective. Holmes used logic more than anyone. Uh, Holmes is not one to partake in the supernatural. But yet what's fascinating about him is the dichotomy between him and his creator. And his creator, Arthur Conan Doyle, had total belief in the spirit world almost to the point of he it seemed like if someone claimed that they spoke on behalf of a spirit, it seemed like Doyle was quick to accept it. Uh, for instance, the case of the of the two girls that claimed that they saw fairies and they had photographs of them taken. And what's well, fun the, yeah, the Fox the Fox sisters that started the whole uh, spiritualist movement, but that was like in the eighteen forties. Um, actually, Conan Doyle was not. He, he, there was a long trajectory uh, of his interest in spiritualism, and he 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 was initially. Uh, as a young man, he was still very interested, even as early as, you know, when he was a doctor in Portsmouth, he was quite interested uh, and joined a spiritualist, uh, a questioning society. Uh, so he was he was interested in the topic, but he was much more kind of agnostic about it as a young man. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as he grew older and as life went on, um, he grew more and more uh, inclined he never said he just straight out, he wanted proof. He wanted actual proof. But what happened is um, toward, you know, as he got older, he lost people very dear to him. He lost right. his, in rapid succession, he lost his first wife and his mother and his uh, son. And, um, and he, you know, one becomes very, you know, confirmation bias basically set in. And so where he was trying to stay more scientific about his, examination of the possibility uh, he grew to want it so much that he he tended to dismiss uh, more readily dismiss the um, evidence against so so but he still he still was a scientist and, and a scientific thinker he as I said he just the confirmation bias over time uh, kind of grew so um, he was never you know like 
whined about it. He right. just wanted it more and more. Right. Well, it seemed like, um, like for example, there were two cases that I'm thinking of. Going back to the uh, the two sisters that I mentioned, um, the case that I'm talking about was two sisters. They had actually cut out pictures of fairies and colored them and oh, set them up. Later ones, the yeah, the fairies, um, the cuttus leaf or whatever, something like that. Um, yeah, the two the two little girls. Um, uh, who yes, who cut up May? <laughs> yeah, and, and 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 basically, you know, futs together these these uh, you know photographs. Yeah, unfortunately, that you know that is a an, an very kind of small incident in the larger life of this very great guy. I think. Right. Right. And, Fortunately, it's 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 like because it's so silly and it's so visual and graphic. I mean, it's something we we tend to fix on, but but it, you know, in the larger picture of his life, it, it's kind of a small thing, really. Right, right. It, it just it, there were times, and then like, uh, and if you ever read books about um, Houdini and the way Doyle and Houdini went back and forth. I mean, like, yeah, they. Uh, they did it in a very interesting way, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I, and I will say, like you read a lot of the Houdini books, they have no problem making Doyle out to be. I'm going to use the word pretty gullible. Um, well, like I said, by that time, at that time in his life, he he wanted it uh, pretty strongly, and um, yeah. and you know Houdini was a you know very much a doubter, and you know with with yeah. good reason, yeah. and he had and he was you know set himself up, but he had kind of an ego about his point of view as well. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, absolutely. So, so, you know, they, they, these guys were very invested at that point, uh, and they were also both really famous. So, it, you know, just kind of ratchets up to be a bigger deal than it than it really is. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, it's not like no two public fee people ever feud, and entire groups of publics take sides with them like that happens yeah. today. We tend to get along very well peacefully when you turn on the news and everything. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like no, like no, nothing yeah. at all. <laughs> so, but with that said, though, um, I do want to. I do want this on record to say that uh, I didn't want to seem like I was criticizing Doyle's uh, character or anything like that because to when anybody you ever read even one of the books on uh, Doyle's background, Doyle had one of the biggest hearts ever and there were constant times when this guy was going bending over backwards to help out people in need. Yeah, he, he was a, a rather heroic and, and courageous man and did a lot of wonderful things for people over, over his life. You know, um, but it's interesting, I mean I think this all this subject does come up a lot and it's because because it's so contradictory to have created, you know, this paragon of rational thinking, you know, yeah. in Sherlock Holmes, and then to, you know, then to be, you know, sort of so interested in, in spiritualism in the, in that particular way, you know, it, it does kind of, it just, it's just an easy thing to fix on, but, but Sherlock Holmes, uh, you know, going back to the character, um, you know, he, he um, you know, he definitely did not believe in, in ghosts. And he, he even said, no ghosts need apply. And he, you know, he said, there's, I'm paraphrasing now, he said something about, you know, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm combating evil in the real world. It'd be a little much to ask me to combat it in, <laughs> in the larger sense. Right, you right. Know. So, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's a paraphrase. It's not, that's not exactly what he said. Right, anyway, no. so, but, so he didn't really believe in that. And also, you know, as I put in the, in the, in the first couple pages of my book on quiet spirits, you know, uh, a you know, a ghostly perpetrator doesn't uh, do, you know does not serve justice at all. You you actually need to find the corporeal perpetrator of something so that you know justice can be served. Uh, you know, so he's not really you know it's it's a, no use to a detective. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Um, exactly. So he, he you know, and and Watson, I don't you know, Watson's a man of science also. He's not a, a quick believer, but he's a more emotional or he's. He, I wouldn't say he's more emotional. I would say he his emotions are closer to the surface, and um, you know, so he yeah he, he would start out, and he did in my book, not believing in ghosts, but you know, right. <laughs> well, because I was going to say one of the things that um, I've always said that basically Watson and Holmes would come to the same conclusion if Watson had a lot more time and resources, ultimately. Like, Sherlock can look at somebody and go, oh, I can tell you were here, this happened, that happened, that happened. Whereas Watson, 
it would probably take him a little bit more time to like maybe follow the person, maybe actually have a conversation. If the person lied, then Watson would kind of use perseverance. See, that, that was the thing that I always thought was so, so amazing about the two of them was Watson was the epitome of perseverance, whereas Sherlock was the epitome of the quick strike. He was able to go like, well, it, and it's yeah. not like he was, he didn't think about it and he was ra irrational. It was, he just had more keen ob observational powers. Well, it's not, it's not only it, the observation. It's, it's really kind of three things. It's the observation, which he's much sharper on than most people. Um, then it's this, um, ability to extrapolate from that observation and then there's a third thing that is not really mentioned so much but is definitely a big part of it is that he has an encyclopedic knowledge of stuff mm. and you know i i um I, I know a couple of people who are kind of in that mental category and and the retention and the mental cataloging of vast amounts of data goes a long way into turning someone into a genius right. and Holmes has that so so and and Watson is he's not stupid at all he does have perseverance like you mentioned but and he also he clearly sees the the chain of logic very quickly he, he's he gets it uh, he but he also doesn't have that vast data store in his head and I think Holmes is not really referred to in the canon but I think he has kind of like what we would call a photographic memory um, yes. you know of data so so that that is actually a big part of being brilliant <laughs> right exactly and, uh, you know and but but on it's interesting because you know as a novelist writing Sherlock Holmes you can't play on that too much because it feels like rabbit out of a hat so in other words if the big plot t turn comes on the fact that you know he knows the cigar ash or he know you know or he knows the right, this or that right. that has to be a small point in the in the story it can't be the big one because otherwise you're going oh well the audience doesn't you know the reader doesn't know that so haha I'm gonna show you know I'm gonna show you up and, and that's not real satisfying to the reader so what you actually you have to do something where it it's, we are Watson, and we go, oh, I did see that, and I did understand that, but I didn't understand that. Right. I, you know, it was there, but I did you know, so you have to kind of construct it so it's not just a turn on his encyclopedic data knowledge. Um, it, he, he will flash that around, you know, kind of like fancy jewels uh, of thinking, but it's not the big turning point. Right. If I can use a... Um like to use like uh, another British hero it's almost like James Bond where like when James Bond's been captured by Blofeld well fortunately James Bond has the exploding cufflinks or he's got something else he's got some other gadget that Q has given him that right. Right, like and the thing is is that we need to see what the gadgets are beforehand so that's always yeah. like and always in all the traditional Bond movies but of course, we know he's going to use them, yeah. and, and the, we'll get a little bit surprised about how. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's that's partly true. Although I think I, I do think that Holmes is a different genre than than um, than James Bond. Uh, you know, I mean, there's a there's a because although the Sherlock Holmes stories are adventures and they're not called the Sherlock Holmes mystery, there is the, the mystery element is extremely important in them, and I think you have a you have a kind of an unstated um, contract with the reader that you have to deliver um, clues in a way that you know that that you get tantalized by, but you you can't quite figure it out yet. <laughs> but right. then it comes together in the end, and then it makes perfect sense once it does. And so that you know, and whereas Bond is a little, it's a little bit more on the physical aspect of stuff like that. Uh, and he's he's resourceful, but it's usually kind of physically oriented. And Holmes has got that. He's got he's pretty strong and pretty. Uh, um, you know he's he's resourceful in that way too, but he has to be primarily a, a mental uh, gymnast. <laughs> right, exactly. Like in most of the Bond, Bond or not Bond stories, in most of the Holmes stories, um, Holmes in a few of them he's actually figured out who the real perpetrator is beforehand. Right. Like I, they give you an example, the Redheaded League. I mean, once yeah, he heard. He, her, yep, yep. Her, the he guys. knew when it was John Clay, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah he knew what was yeah. going on, and then when he was walking around tapping the street with his walking stick, he just basically said, okay, I have an idea of what's going on, now let's, now let's 
push this forward to see if this well, actually yeah, he, happens. He sometimes delays telling because he needs he needs what's going to be proof in a court of law. Sometimes yeah. he delays for that reason. But sometimes and sometimes he delays so that the the perpetrator will like deliver himself into his hands, basically like that one. But also he sometimes just delays because he's theatrical. Yes. <laughs> You know, and he just like, you know, so he, he kind of plays it along because it's fun for him to, right. you know, to whisk the tablecloth out from under the, the dishes, you know, or whatever. Right. Um, it's, you know, he's like that. So, right. so he does it for different reasons. But sometimes he really just does it because he's pretty sure, but he knows he has to be 100% sure. And also he's, you know, if, because people could still uh, slip through the law if, if he didn't have the correct proof. Um, you know, so he wanted to make sure these guys were going to pay for their crimes. Right, exactly. Now, um, going back to uh, Unquiet Spirits, and you've said that you've been, you've already started work on your third book. Um, when you're writing these, is and at the risk of sounding silly about it, but I'll ask it this way: Is it like revisiting an old friend? Is this like you know, like a friend that you haven't talked to in a long time? You write. Um, your first book. Well, at the risk of sounding completely crazy, done. I do talk to him all the time. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what I do. You know, that's, that's what I do for a living here. Um, but yeah, it's very much uh, people. Watson and Holmes are people I like to spend time with. And so the, in, during the writing process, I'm actually spending time with them. I mean, they are in my head as live as anybody in the room. Uh, and they have to be in order to come out onto the page. So yes, it's very much uh, people I want to be with. Right. And the last time when you told me when you were writing Art in the Blood, you were writing, uh, you said that you had kept a window open with the canon to make sure that your writing sounded uh, similar to Doyle's or to try and be as close to Doyle as you possibly could. Um, this time around, did you take uh, did you take any more liberties with it? Did you um, did you kind of go? Well, you know what? This is as great as Sherlock is for Doyle, and as much as I love Doyle, and I'm trying to stay true. Ultimately, this is my Sherlock story, and at some point, I want that to reflect who Bonnie McBird is. That type of thing. Did did you um, take uh, do anything like that with this, or were you straight? You know, to, I, I don't. I don't really think of it that way, Don, at all, actually, um, okay. because I, I no, actually, I don't. I think of it as um, what I I have a very clear goal in my head about what I'm trying to set out to do. So, in many ways, I'm trying to be as close to Doyle as possible. And as an artist, as a writer, um, I feel like that is a worthy goal because he's a genius. So, a aiming to be like that is is you know, pretty much impossible and a worthy goal because the closer you get, the better the writing is. So, so that's one thing. So I don't, I don't think like, but I also, in terms of how it fits in the canon, I do want it to fit in the canon. So some of that's purely mechanical. So, so for example, I'll look at, there's different chronologies that different people have done about when the cases took place at what year and what month and so on yeah. and and there's not really a consensus I mean I, I'm used less clingers um, and and I basically so I place my stories at a time that another case wasn't going on and this particular one Unquiet Spirits takes place in, De in December of 1889 and it's right after the Hound of the Baskervilles so right. they've, just, they've just come off this ghostly case or you know that isn't a ghost or this you know haunted uh, dog that is just a guy you know this dog painted with horse and paint right. so you know um so that they just come off that but it was scarier than you know than hack to to do this so so uh so in that way i try to fit it within the canon but i never go oh what can bonnie bring to this i i never think that because i i, I feel like it's i don't write from that kind of ego position instead i'm writing yeah. for i'm writing from like how can i bring you the reader on an amazing ride I see. and so, so I'm so it's like it's the same thing I did when I wrote movies is like I, I want to create a piece of entertainment that is so fun for you and so interesting right. for you that you get that you just are pulled out of your ordinary life and into this 
into right. this world. And and I like being in that world. So I feel like if I can bring you there, we'll ha you know, that you'll have as good a time as I'm having. So it isn't about what I can bring. It's more like w the ride I can bring you on. Right. And, and that's very also that's very much in sync with what Conan Doyle was doing. And so it's not like oh how can I be different or better or unique or something. And so you know, on the one hand, you could criticize me for that. It's like, well, she's not bringing anything new to the table, and so, you know, and there are lots of creative takes on homes that are being written. You know, homes with various you know, monsters and supernatural, and you know, all kinds of stuff, yeah. time travel, and everything. You know, but that's not what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is uh, emulate closely as possible to the original, but meanwhile, create an all new story. So it's an all new story as opposed to an all new take. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, it's all about the story for me. Now, I did take, I did cross over, uh, and I, I, I took some risks with this one. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and that's been commented on, and and actually quite uh, with with a lot of compliments. So I, I was a little nervous about it, <laughs> um, but uh, but I also feel I didn't contradict anything in canon. Right. So where I took the big risk, Don, obviously, was in 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 providing a little backstory about something we didn't know about Holmes. Um, and I was very, very careful with doing that. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, and, and it's and that's one of the things why, like, right before when we were chatting and right before I started recording this, I was saying how this book was really wonderfully written. And if anything, it seemed like, like especially the opening pages when, like. For people that are into Holmes, like I was reading someplace where people say, read Sherlock Holmes canon twice. The first time for the adventures, and then the second time for the friendship between him and Watson. And the times when you saw him and Watson, it was always at the beginning of the adventure and always at the end of the adventure. That was, you read for their interactions. And the interactions that you had between... Um, Holmes and Watson, especially in chapter one, entitled Stillness, that that was fun. That was like really fun. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad. <laughs> that, that was really fun and I enjoyed that. I really did because it seemed like it seemed like it seemed like you were reading two friends hanging out. It was like because I've read some versions of Holmes and Watson where I don't know if it's the writer or something, but it just doesn't gel well for some reason. Your Holmes and your Watson felt very natural together. Well, I think the, I think the friendship. Most people who who deeply love the, the the Holmes canon, you know, will will point out exactly what you said, which is the friendship is really crucial to the to the fact that these things work and and have lived for 130 years and we still love them and we still read them is that these this this friendship there's something very uh i don't know fortifying there's something very f sort of fun and comforting and and everybody would like to have a friend like watson who yes. totally understands them and yet makes excuses for their you know, their their faults but also you'd like to be a friend like watson and yeah. be able to you know uh, be with somebody who's fascinating and brilliant and have a, an adventure with them and be be of use you know everybody would like to be of use uh, you know and, and I think so these guys the, the two men uh, fulfill a lot of uh, people's notions of what an ideal friendship and and friendship is rare I mean people we don't most of us don't have a Holmes or Watson partner you know what yeah. I mean I mean we have people we love and and people we hang out with and have fun and so forth. But but this kind of like I I lay my life on the line for you, uh, thing is is really special. And, right, um, right. See, I was thinking of it from the perspective of um, if you like, my wife is is the most wonderful woman on the planet. But if I had one of my friends knock on the door at like one in the morning saying. Um, we need to be someplace in an hour <laughs> or like you know you get a it's like oh i got a text message from my uh from a friend of mine uh he said um if you can come um if you can come please be at 
this place in 10 minutes. If you can't come, come anyway. So yeah, right. well, it's, it's like... You, <laughs> that's Holmes, yeah, so of course. Yeah, exactly. So it's that type of thing. So it was really, it's really fascinating to, to, to like, like you would love, you wish you had a friend like that. And you also wish that that friend had as understanding of a spouse <laughs> the way yeah, that Mary yeah. was. Yeah, because uh, Watson is married at the time of these stories. So yes, uh, yeah, definitely. But, you know, I have, I have her in my head uh, as... She's not really on the page. Uh, she's a passing mention of her. But I have her in my head as somebody who has a full life of her own, mm -hmm. uh, as being one of these kind of women who is called on by her own friends to be helpful. And she has a, you know, so she'll go take care of a sick friend and she'll go, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. She's kind of like, you know, sort of in, a, in a some ways li rather like him. Yeah. Uh, and not that she's off with another Sherlock or anything like that, but I, and she's not that fully formed because she's not on the page much, but, but that she does have a full life and she's not, you know, the little woman sitting at home waiting for Watson to come home and, you know, regale her with stories. Um, so, so she, you know, she has life, but, um, you know, which leads me to another topic. Um, I get really interested because obviously I'm female. I get really interested in my female characters. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, I, I do I do find the position of women at that time, of course, was much more restricted. But there were women in all walks of life who sort of punched through that and were were very effective. Yeah. So did you know, for example, that 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 uh, there's a woman mentioned in the um, in the in the book, uh, Elizabeth uh, Cardu, who who ran Cardu Distillery. Right. Uh, so she was the head of a distillery at that time, which right. like. Was, yeah, like you, know, nobody, so, you would never so, hear. So there were women, that. you know, there were women that were, <laughs> you know, were doing. I kind of pulled the topic over here. I realize that, um, but there were women that you know really were doing some very uh, daring and interesting stuff at the time. Oh yeah, but that was at the time when you were um, you were dealing with a lot of very daring people because I I've, I've always been of the belief that probably the best time for technology has been in the. Um, Late between like the 1880s and 1920s, that it was 40 a very years. you're right, it was a very exciting time. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and it's and what it boiled down to was like, yeah, sure, like the internet and everything, and a lot of great stuff is happening. We've become very dependent, but the thing is, is that um, a lot of the, a lot of um, other than medical breakthroughs, the la the most the big breakthroughs of the last 30 years has been all computer and computer software related. Um, right. And then like, I mean, like, of course we have like medical science that's been doing well, but it's like the idea of um, like warfare had been going on the same way for like thousands of years up until about the mid 1850s, 1860s, when people started going, hey, you know what, maybe we shouldn't be doing one line of people here, another line of people there, let them meet in the middle, and then uh, last, the people with the most standing at the end of the day are the winners. Maybe we should do this differently. And you began seeing it differently, and especially with World War One, World War Two, and so forth. And a lot of those, um, I mean, the internet is just, like, at the risk of sounding silly, it's just a glorified communication of radio. Um, basically, I get to be, or telegraph even, I get to be here um, in London, or I get to be here in uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, you're in England, um, and we get to communicate with each other. Uh, it's it's the same way. I can email you. Uh, you can email me. We can see each other. We cannot see each other, whatever it is, but it's all thanks to video. But um, in, in those 40 years, men were doing amazing things. And then at the same time that was going on, women were going, wait a minute, wait a minute. We need a say too. And we're not just going to stand off to the side and just let the big old men take care of it. Like you, like many of the women started popping up right now doing amazing things like this. And they were saying mores and taboos and restrictions aside, we're going to step forward. So it's, so it's perfectly reasonable for you to have a character uh, like the lady that was running the brewery. Isla, yeah, Isla is, well, the character in my book isn't running the distillery. She, Sorry. The one running the distillery is a real character. I, I said her, her last name was not 
Cardew, I forget what it is at the moment, but um, it was Cardew Distillery. Uh, but but Isla McLaren, the leading uh, female character in, in Unquiet Spirits, is um, uh, is somebody who is you know quite a quite a force of nature. <laughs> Right, <laughs> and and uh, I don't, you know, I actually don't want to tell too much about her because it would spoil um, some of the surprise at the end. Uh, except that, um, you know, I think she's a kind of a worthy opponent, and um, and also I think what's fun is that he reacts so strongly negatively to her uh, at the beginning, and Watson assumes it's because she's, you know, challenging and sharp. Uh, and it's, and we later find out, no, that isn't the reason. He had a sort of sub subliminal reaction to her for another very good reason. Right. But um, you know that, but that she, you know, that she is, um, you know, that she kind of, uh, you know, there's the fun thing of her kind of taking him on and so forth. Um, so you know, I, I don't know. It's in terms of that goes back to you know your earlier question, Don. It's like, what am I trying to do with this? Am I you know, is that a Mary Sue thing? Because I, I would want to be a, you know, a sharp, interesting female taking him on. It's like, no, it's what I want to see. It's what I want to read. I want to read and enjoy the fireworks of this. Right. And, um, you know, cause, cause, you know, and, and, and th that happens a few times in canon. I mean, there's, you know, certainly Irene Adler, of course. Uh, but, uh, you know, that the, there's some, there's some strong, definitely some strong women in canon. And, uh, and, um, so I think it's it's a question of like what's fun to watch like what, and the other thing is um, going back to the notion of ghosts. So clearly Holmes doesn't believe in ghosts. Right. But as Watson brings up the fact in in chapter one, uh, it's like well we're not talking ghosts. We're talking about what about ghosts of our past? In other words, things we things we've left unsaid and people we could have helped or some people we've lost and. Everybody carries around with them some ghosts of the of this sort, right. and 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 if you don't deal with them, what is what is the consequence of that? So so um, so the notion is that you know Holmes is uh, you know in order to do the kind of thinking that he does, the kind of really high level uh, thinking, not only processing but accessing all that data and and then extrapolating things from it, he. he in order to do that kind of mental processing, he has to put a lot of his life on hold or away. So that's why he doesn't socialize and he doesn't, um, you know, he doesn't follow all the niceties. He doesn't write a lot of thank you notes, I would imagine. You know what I mean? He just, yeah, exactly. He's just following all the prescribed stuff. He he just puts all his energy into thinking and and doing his, you know, his his cases. And and I think that's, you know, so that's that would make sense that he wouldn't maybe deal with stuff. He would just say, go, this isn't useful to me. I'm putting it over here in this little box, this little mental box, and it's not useful to me. I'm not even going to visit it. And and people who do that, sometimes that comes around to bite you. <laughs> he, he's very sensitive to children, and that's in the canon. I mean, he's got, he, he, um, which, which, which happens twice in, in both, in, in one, once in each of my books. He, he is very, um, uh, and they definitely emphasize that in the Jeremy Brett uh, Granada series as well. Um, so he, with his, uh, you know, his ragged uh, Baker Street Irregulars, the raggedy boys, um, you know, that he, t you know, he, he's sensitive to children, actually. Right, and, and, right. and um, which is another clue to him, to me, uh, like, you know, what was, what happened to him as a child? You, you, you get, I think, from the canon, uh, the sense that there's some damaged goods there. Right. This this is a man who suffered some damage as a young person, possibly, um, and and you know you don't want to you don't want to show it entirely because the mystery of the man is part of the delicious quality of the character. Right, uh, right. And it allows us to each kind of have our own homes in a way. Right. Uh, and and I and I respect that as a writer, so I don't want to I don't want to try to fill in all those holes because because we we each kind of bring to Holmes a little bit of ourself, you know, yes. who we are and so forth. And, and so, so, you know, he, his, so we sometimes go, oh, well, he's oblivious the way I'm oblivious, or he's got a sense of humor the way I have a sense of humor, or he doesn't like stupid people like I don't like stupid people. Right. You know, we all find these like these little things that we, you know, it's like me because I'm this way. And, but we do that a bit with Watson as well. And, and so, you know, we, we have to, but, but Holmes especially is that guy we kind of want to be like. 
uh, or we find we find parallels to ourselves. So we have to leave him a little bit in the darkness there, because otherwise we don't have that pleasure. Right, right. I always call that finding out how Superman flies. Um, yeah, you don't want to fly that out. Yeah, yeah. you don't want you don't want the physics uh, you know explanation. Yeah, exactly. The yeah. lift under the cape and the blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. His cellular structure means that he's able to absorb the sun, and then by doing X, Y, and Z, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, we just want to know that. We can just chalk it up to he came to Earth from another planet because he's alien. He can fly. Leave it at that. Don't try to explain it. Except, except, so we don't want to know the deep, dark secrets of his personality, but we do want to know how he figured out stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Which is part of the fun of that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Now, when you're writing a Holmes novel, because we were talking about... Um, we were talking about like how you had brought up Irene Adler early. Do you do you ever sit down and find yourself going, boy, I'd really love to use my or, or you know what? Let me take a step back. Whenever you see an interpretation of Sherlock Holmes, um, there's always some level of when is Irene Adler, when is this version of Irene Adler going to pop up? When is this version of Moriarty going to pop up? When is Lestrade going to pop up? When is Mycroft going to pop up? Do you, are you careful with how you use those oh, yeah. characters? Yes. Or do you have them pop up for the sake of having them pop up? I, I'm like, do you watch out for that is what I mean. No, I have a very distinct choice that I've made there. Like, uh, Mycroft is a character in both books. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I made a choice about Mycroft. He's he's very little in the canon. He's just, I think, three stories. Yeah. And, and, and he's not on stage much. Uh, you know what I mean by on, on page, really, but on stage. You, you don't see much of Mycroft. You hear about him a little bit more than that, but you don't see much of him. Um, and I made a choice uh, with Mycroft uh, and I have to admit that I, I, in a sense, borrowed from BBC, but they, in a sense, borrowed from Private Lives. The notion that, uh, so it's been done by many, is what I'm pointing at. Right. Uh, the notion that Mycroft's um, relationship with Sherlock is just a tinge more hostile or dangerous than, uh, than it is on the page in canon. Right. So in canon, you get the sense that there may be a little competition between the two, and Mycroft is older, so you can imagine how that might have played out when they were kids. But, and he's also supposed to be smarter. Um, but on the other hand, there's not really a sense of danger or malevolence there in canon. But but in, in a couple of the more interesting uh, later developments, like I said, Private Lives and and BBC, and, and, and they have put that in, and I quite like the story juice that that provides. And so I have definitely um, put a bit of mystery and a little bit of um, hostility between the two brothers. Uh, but they also work together, so because I think that's a really complicated and fun and interesting relationship. So yes, I very consciously chose to bring Mycroft in and make him a little bit of a um, uh, you know, a little bit of a spice to the to the right, story, right? And right, then, right. And and then I um I had Lestrade in, um and Mrs. Hudson, and that's that's it. I I think Irene is a is particular to one of the stories. She's a character in one of the cases. So I, and also she goes away, and then later she dies. So I I don't really. I will never bring Irene in, um, but so each the rest of the cast of my books, uh, the cast of characters is is all original. Uh, so so basically it's uh, and I have not brought in Moriarty, although there's a one little moment in this second book where you think somebody being referred to might be him. Right. Uh, but but he's not in he's not in either book and um, and uh, but just Lestrade and Mrs. Hudson and. Um, and Mycroft are, are in the book from from the originals. Right, right, exactly. Because um, I would think that sometimes, like, it just seems like when somebody gets a hold of something, they want to cram as much of the um, as That's much of the uh, characters from the canon as much as they possibly can into it. Well, so. that that can be an exercise in you know that can be a, a particular. Uh, artistic challenge you might want to set for yourself, you know, um, and you know that might be something like, how can I? Do, maybe your question is, how can I do something interesting with Irene? Well, lots of people 
have thought that and have done that. So you know, there there are you know, there's arguments for and against that. And each writer, I'm not I'm not advocating or or damning this idea. I just I, as a as a writer, I chose to try to create completely new stories that might have fit in with the canon. Right. The only, well, one of the big differences, of course, is that I'm writing long form, and he didn't write long form. Right. Um, I got to ask this, just speaking only because we brought up Mycroft. If you look at a picture of Mycroft that Sidney Paget drew, drew yeah. tell me he does not look like Stephen Fry. I mean, when they when <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Robert Downey Jr. movies picked Stephen R Fry to play Mycroft, I went, that is beyond perfect. It was quite fun, although I didn't like the hair. But yeah, he he was he's quite fun as as Mycroft, and he he just is so well. Fry, Stephen Fry, you know, he's a huge Sherlockian. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, he was thrilled to be doing that, and um, <laughs> yeah, he's. He's completely funny in that role and wonderful. Yeah. Uh, although I, I, I it, to me, you know, but see, everybody has their taste here. But I, you know, I didn't want to see him, you know, naked. <laughs> <laughs> Nor did I think that was particularly in character. But you know, that was the director and the screenwriter. That was you know the ride they wanted to give you. <laughs> yeah, they wanted to do that. <laughs> That's funny. You know, I, I actually really enjoyed those movies tremendously. I can't wait for the third one. I, um, I, yeah, I will flat out say they were the ones that got me into Sherlock. Like, like I've always liked Sherlock Holmes, but they were the ones that inspired me to get back into it. Uh, yeah. Get back into this and ultimately led to uh, me, through a couple of little things here and there, led to me creating the Sherlock conversation. So I will forever be grateful for those yeah, movies. let me ask you something. So you originally came through to it through the books, Don? Well, the first time I ever got into Sherlock was my father used to read a, um, it was one of those copies of, uh, like somebody would take a book, like a big thick novel, and then they would edit it down for children. And then on one page you would have text, and then on another you would have almost like a, like a comic book panel. And my father read me a copy of um, The Hound of the Baskervilles. And I actually wrote a whole post on the Sherlock Conversations about the importance of reading, of parents reading to their children because of this, and how Sherlock is a great series of books to get into it. And I had always was like, oh, wow, that's really cool. And I always had an affinity for the character, but I kind of stepped away. And it wasn't until, like, maybe within the last... 10 years like I was working at a job I really didn't like and I was having a whole bunch of personal issues going down and I'm I came across something Sherlock related where it was basically Sherlock has a way of putting up a mental filter that he allows what he wants in and yes, blocks yes. out and that was the thing that made me a fan of his and I would and I rewatched um and I started re um I watched the Robert Downey Jr. Uh, movies and um, I found myself there are aspects of uh, Robert Downey Jr. as an as a person that I found myself really relating to and I loved his to me yeah. he is the best redemption story oh that, yeah, yeah totally and, yeah yeah and I was really drawn to that and Sherlock himself I mean there are yeah. aspects like like right at that time and I'm a big comic book fan I mean a big crux of it was right there in Robert Downey Jr. when he was playing Tony Stark and he was playing Sherlock Holmes at the same time and they're both both Tony Stark and Sherlock Holmes are addicts that still overcome their demons to to do something right. great for Cer the world. Yeah, it certainly attracted him to, the, to those roles, and he can certainly pull them off. Uh, yeah, he's. I admire him so much. Yeah, exactly. And that was what did it for me. And then ultimately, what led to me doing the Sherlock conversations, or I would jump onto Facebook pages talking about Sherlock, and I'd go back and forth, and I made a couple of friends doing that. But ultimately, what did it for me was when um, I heard Lindsay Fay in an interview on a podcast, I think it was called Readers and Writers, I'd have to look it up again. But she she was sitting there talking about how she got into Sherlock and everything, and there was something inside me that got really annoyed. And it wasn't like I was annoyed at her, it was, why aren't you doing your part for Sherlockdom? You need to be doing something Sherlocky. And like, and it, be, and it got to the point where I was, I was actually miserable about it. Like, I had an ache about it. It was, 
Uh, it, it was, and I finally sat down and I just started a WordPress blog and I just typed in, well, what am I going to call this? And I had had other podcasts called Conversations with Friends and Creators and other stuff. And I ultimately said, I'm calling this the Sherlock Conversations. And then that's what led to me starting the website, uh, starting the blog. And I've been doing a lot of work on Facebook. And right now, probably in the next six months or so, you're going to see a lot. Sherlock is going to have the Sherlock Conversations is going to have a bigger presence than it does. Uh, because I looked at it and I was like, why are like, I wanted to be a part of this. I wanted to be a part of this community and this fandom and everything, because there's just something so giving and forgiving and, um, possessive about Sherlock because the thing that I loved about Sherlock actually and the other in the other way that I got into this I can't believe I'm completely forgetting it, it is the other backdoor route I got into Sherlock Holmes was um, through Doctor Who uh, I saw an interview Richard e., uh, Richard E. Grant who is who really should be playing Sherlock in some role in some place um, he did the voice of the Doctor in a um, animated version of the Ninth Doctor, and I read an interview with him that it said Sherlock Holmes or Doctor Who is Sherlock Holmes in outer space, and that just like blew the right side of my brain, and I was like, oh my goodness, he's absolutely correct. And so the more I started getting into Doctor Who, and then at the same time that all the Robert Downey Jr. stuff was going on, Stephen Moffat came out with the Cumberbatch Sherlock at the same time he was running Doctor Who. So all of those played together was what made me go, I've got to jump in on this. Yeah, it's it's what's interesting, yeah, I, I also jumped in a lot of different times throughout my life. I started with the books actually themselves when I was mm -hmm. ten, I read the whole thing. And then I was watching the black and white on television, the you know, the Basil Rathbone yes. on TV. And then uh, I and the next time that I got a big Sherlock hit was in the 60s when Star Trek came out and Spock is like, oh, same guy yeah. <laughs> in a way, or a very similar guy. And I found myself really attracted to both of these characters. And um, so then, then, then again, uh, let's see, then there was like, um, oh, there was a whole bunch of stuff. There was, well, of course, Private Lives, 7% Solution, right, right. Um, Young Sherlock Holmes, um, and The Great Mouse Detective, um, and then House. Yes. House. You know, I, I turned on House, the first episode, and in 10 minutes, I'm like, this is Sherlock Holmes. Oh, my God. And I was like, it's riveted. And of course, Hugh Laurie is so, so wonderful. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so he was Sherlock also. So, so you know, all of this was kind of, um, you know, so I just keep, I kept touching in. And then, and then Robert Downey Jr. and then Benedict Cumberbatch. And although I'm never really attached to Johnny Lee Miller as Sherlock, but almost all of them have have drawn me in in some way and and um, and so it's been really you know I keep renewing on this stuff and then throughout all of this I just keep returning to the books the books themselves and you know they're just so damn good so yeah, exactly. it, and, and like you said you read them once for one thing and another second time for another you can read them over and over and and find new stuff each time yeah. and um, so I don't know if you've seen the book about sixty uh, that Chris Redmond um, edited. That he's a famous Sherlockian, and he uh, he did this. He asked uh, sixty Sherlockians to pick their favorite story, or in some cases, because it was already taken, he assigned them the story, right. <laughs> and and they would write. The, the, they were supposed to write why it's the best story, but some people just, you know, I got assigned one that wasn't my favorite, and yet I really like it, right. and so I wrote why it's great, basically. Right. Um, and so, it, so the it's quite fun to read this book because you see how all these different people savor these things, and they savor them for different reasons, you know, and and right. there's just so much stuff there for everybody, right. and um, and it's fun. You you get together with Sherlockians, and you can talk. You can find yourself talking about wine or Goethe or you know the Industrial Revolution or you know Oxford or uh, you just suddenly you're talking about any number of things, and it's so fun. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is. And one yeah. of the things that is great about it is, is that also because I was a big star, I, I'm, I'm not a, um, I love Star Trek. I will admit I'm not a Trekkie. Like I couldn't name all the Klingon prime ministers that were running the Klingon Empire for the last 400 years. I'm not that big of an expert type of thing. But the connection between Star Trek and Sherlock 
is is it, it goes in such wonderful directions between Data dressing up as Sherlock and Nicholas Meyer, his connection to um, the Sherlock mythology and him, uh, and he was the guy that basically helped kill Spock. And when he came back and directed um, uh, Star Trek VI, there's actually a line where Spock says, as one of my ancestors used to say, if you eliminate the impossible, whatever right. remains <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. So, I mean. So yeah, he, were, I think his movie was the best uh, Was the best Star Trek movie. Yeah, and, and most people most people agree with that. And, um, and Nicholas Meyer himself, he wrote, um, what was it? They just did a... Uh, uh, a Houdini. A couple of years ago, they did a Houdini um, biography that he was a part of, right. uh, and he was also just recently um, his old uh, his time movie, after time. Yeah, was just brought back. So Nicholas Myers is like, is it Meyer or Myers? Um, Meyer. He, yeah, Meyer. He he was like like you would not have. I firmly believe you would not have had a modern Sherlockdom because I actually sat down and I was talking about it with a common friend of ours, Luke uh, Benjamin. Tunes. And I actually yeah. sat down and I said, you know, you can map out the ages of Sherlock by who played him or who's predominantly playing him. And I actually said, the only difference, the only two writers that were in that are you have the age of Doyle, which bleeds into the age of Gillette, which bleeds into the age of Rathbone. And Nicholas Meyer is the bridge between Rathbone and Brett. And then Brett bleeds into the age of Cumberbatch. And it's kind of like, and I firmly believe that Meyer, had he not done the six percent solution, we would seven, not see seven. Seven, <laughs> sorry, the seven percent solution. Oh boy, am I out? out. Um, if he had not done the seven percent solution, we would not have the pastiches that we have today, because he was the one that really pioneered. Like things went from being fan fiction to pure literature, and Meyer was the one that that did that. And uh, and I. And he and I firmly believe that he was the one that kept. Uh, he was a big reason why the fan, uh, why the flames of Sherlockdom were able to still burn by the time Jeremy Brett came around. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. Well, seven percent was very much groundbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. It was fantastic. Uh, as we're speaking, I'm sitting here looking at my bookcase across the room, and I have all three of his books um, signed by him. Uh, he. Oh, wow. I want won them at a at an auction uh, last January, and uh, Nicholas actually read my book and and gave me comments on it. Oh, that was very nice. It's in my it's in my uh, um, uh, attributions at the end there, um, the acknowledgments. You'll you'll see that in there. Right, right. Let me see. I'm going to see if I can find it here. Uh, yeah, because we know Leslie Klinger commented and um, a couple other people. Uh, Harley Jane Kozak and uh, oh, no, the, oh, those are the blurbs. I'm talking yeah, about sorry. acknowledgments. Um, uh, I mentioned Nick because he actually was very kind enough to give me uh, give me his thoughts during this. So oh, that, that was is, that's yeah. Great. He he uh, he lives near me. <laughs> Does he really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's 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 a very talented man. Oh yeah, he's inc he's very good. He's very good. You cannot look at him or you cannot look at any of his work and not go wow this guy's good so yeah so um so let's re very quickly let's talk about the third book uh that you said that you have already started work on it is it kind of like again do you feel like you're hanging out with some friends again like you know it's oh, like definitely you yeah very much so yeah um yeah definitely i mean i uh uh, I, I basically like spending time in this world. I'm really interested in the Victorian era. Um, I'm actually sitting right now in a building one block off Baker Street. Um, oh, wow. That And the building itself was built in 1890, which is the time of the next story, by the right. way. Um, and the first one was eight, uh, Art in the Blood was 1888, and then In Quiet Spirits was 1889, and this next one's going to be 1890, which is the year that this building was built <laughs> that I'm sitting in. Nice. And, um, and, uh, and I'm really getting involved and interested in the time period, so that's how I started both of them. Um, moving back to Unquiet Spirits for a minute, um, uh, one of the 
the big ideas behind that book was um, was something that was based on what was going on right then in 1889. Um, and there was this gigantic um, thing called the phylloxera epidemic that mm -hmm. decimated the vineyards of France. And um, as a result, wine and cognac and brandy, all these things that were that were grape based, were suddenly very expensive and scarce. And so um, what happened was whiskey, there were whiskey uh, distilleries all up in Scotland that had gone through a very tumultuous phase of being illegal and all kinds of stuff. But all of a sudden, um, with this very, it became difficult to get the stuff that people were drinking a lot of. And the whiskey barons came to town, came to London and said, we're going to set up whiskey as the new drink of society. And these very daring guys basically invented modern marketing. Oh, interesting. And, uh, yeah, it was a really kind of strange and funny time. And so, you know, there's a bit about that in the book. Um, but um, so, so this phylloxera epidemic, nobody, for a while, they didn't even know what it was. They, they couldn't, it, it turned out to be a little parasite that was eating away at the roots. But by the time the, the, the decimation happened, they were gone. And so they couldn't find out what was causing it. But finally, this very Sherlock-like scientist figured this out and figured out the cure. And his name, his real life name was Pierre Viala. In my book, he's, uh, he's Dr. Jean Vier. Uh, but, uh, but it's based on a real life guy who was very Sherlock-like and was the same age as Sherlock and, uh, in 1889. So, so that's why they go down to Montpellier to, to meet this Dr. Jean Vier because um, what, you know, I got this notion, like, what if, what if this was industrial sabotage? Right. What if, you know, what if this whole epidemic that really messed up the, the wine industry was something that was kind of set into motion by somebody who could really, you know, profit from that? Right. So that was kind of this, now there's no historical evidence whatsoever. Of about course. But, but this but is was, part of the fun of it. This is part of yeah, the fun. Yeah, and exactly. I, and I've always been of the opinion that when you write a book like this, all you're doing is creating an alternate reality now. So that means that in that reality, that's true. Yeah, I mean, it could, it could have been. I mean, it, it's plausible. It's not likely, but it is plausible. Yeah. So, so that was kind of a fun thing. So, you know, I like to sort of research exactly what, what is going on. So, so this building that I'm in right now is um, is one block off of Baker Street, uh, and the and it was built, as I said, the year of this next book, and it the back of the building fronted onto what was the Marlebone Workhouse. Right, it was this huge, one of the larger workhouses, and I've sort of been reading up on that. And oh my God, what a terrible place to be! Um, and you you read about how poor people, the last thing they wanted was to go into the workhouse because it was really only one step away from jail. Yeah. And, and yet they were not criminals. They had done nothing wrong. They just were, you know, de you know, desperate um, yeah. and so forth. So it's just, it, anyway, the times are very tumultuous. Um, and uh, lots of exciting science and art was going on at the time, but also massive homelessness and, and poverty. So it was really a very dramatic. Yeah, period. exactly. Yeah, because, like, they, at that time, people were creating the, um, that was when you had the Industrial Revolution and the, oh, Goodness, the the conveyor lines. Uh, the oh, what is that term I'm looking oh, well, for? Well, the factory factories were invented, yeah. and 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 but the, the biggest uh, transformative um, technology w was the railroads. Yes, uh, I mean there were many. I mean there's electricity, there's steam, and then there was electricity. There was the railroads. There was uh, a lot of big transformative things that happened. Probably the root transformation was the railroads because it suddenly meant that, uh, and Telegraph also came in there, but uh, it, it meant that places that were remote were no longer remote. And so it connected everybody. And so, you know, up in, uh, you know, Lancashire, you could have the news in a few hours instead of, you know, and from the Telegram, Telegraph also, you, you, you would have to wait weeks, days and weeks to get news. And now suddenly news was everywhere and you could be on the train and be anywhere so it just completely and now you all had to be have a watch because you had to be on railroad time right because everything had to be in sync so massive changes uh were happening um so so with technology it was probably i think like you said earlier in our conversation it was the the era uh 
like today where so much transformed so quickly the rate of change changed right and so that kind of upended people it inspired them and it had great effects but it also made people just confused and kind of like fish out of water i mean people were things changed so fast that that uh, people were struggling really to keep up right exactly i mean again what's the same way i'm like you're creating all of this industrial revolution and people are like going great now we have these giant gears and it isn't until like oh maybe we should put in safety precautions after somebody loses an arm and and it's like the um i always go back to the triangle uh, work workhouse fires where the where like a bunch of women were killed uh, at the shirt factory the triangle shirt factory fires uh, that was one of the steps that basically said we need to put laws in place and we need to need to put things in place so it was like we got the technology but people didn't have the safety standards of how to use the technology type of thing and so in and, and so like having people back in the 1880s and 1890s it took a while for that to catch on that, hey, you know, maybe we should have some rules and some other things in place so that people aren't working 14 hour days, falling asleep and going straight forward into a printing press type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Bonnie, um, I got to tell you, this is a great book again. And uh, I, I did want to ask you, um, have you, you've done a lot of writing. Have you considered doing uh st like now that sherlock holmes is your calling and everything have you considered writing anything else like have you been inspired like you know i like sherlock but i've had this idea for this thing over there or to write something oh yeah, yeah I, have, I have a couple bu books on the back burner <laughs> yes i do um uh, one is a uh, present day um mystery uh right. modern day mystery and i also have in mind to do um a series of essays. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how I would characterize them, but uh, nonfiction, some nonfiction essays. Uh, I have a bunch of topics in my head that I would like to <laughs> explore. Interesting things that have happened in my life um, and stuff. So, um, but yeah, so I do. I do. I actually do have some other ideas, and I and I do write plays, and mm -hmm. you know, I have written a lot of plays, and I I've been feeling a little bit of a pull to do some theater again. Um, it's a lovely. Um, contrast to spending you know uh days and days alone in a room <laughs> right right <laughs> what you do when you write a novel uh and 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 i'm an extrovert so that's kind of challenging but um right, yeah right. so so i have yeah i have been thinking about some other things but they're they've got to wait because this is this is pretty all-consuming i have to say um right, i don't know how right. other people do lots of things at once but i i have to pretty much focus on on homes and and the victoria because it's not just writing the story it's you know doing all the historical research and so forth, um, but I did a lot of uh, I had a lot of fun actually. But I did a lot of research for for Unquiet Spirits. Um, I visited seven distilleries. Oh, nice! How much all, sampling I, did you get to do along the way? <laughs> Yeah, that was part of it. You know, those kind of like the please don't throw me in the briar patch part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, darn. I have to research this whiskey thing, you know? Right, so, right. So I actually, yeah, I went, um, yeah, I went to uh, up to the highlands and I visited, up, the one I visited there was uh, Royal Loch Nagar, which is the one right near Balmoral where the queen has her right. her um, residence. And, um, and I set the story in that area. Um, and I also visited some castles up there and there was one in particular that was somewhat the model for Braydern Castle mm. in the book. And uh, I got some really fun ideas from basically location scouting, just like you would for a movie. And um, so I got whole sequences of ideas when I was basically location scouting up there. But then the probably the, one of the most fun things was I went to the um, island of Isla, which is spelled like Islay, I-S-L-A-Y. Right. And and at this place, there is a there's that's just a whole island that is nothing but distilleries, pretty much. It's got the whiskey business and the tourist business. And that's it. And but the one of the distilleries is called Bruchlade, and it is um, it is the only distillery which is currently operating with Victorian equipment. Oh, interesting. 
Yeah, yeah. So it's it's actually the equipment that was of the time of the story, and it's they're using it. So I went there very specifically to to see it, uh, and to to notice what it looked like and how it worked and all this stuff. And um, it was um, fascinating. And I and the whole you know the big climax, uh, you know the big action scene at the end is basically based on stuff I saw there. I mean, that stuff in, I don't want to give it away, but right. the, the stuff in that, it, right, that existed, right. existed and it was exactly as I described. Uh, and when I saw it, it was like, oh boy, the big scene is here, right here. <laughs> you know, and I just, I just knew it was there. And uh, can you just see Downey in that? Right. That be- oh, <laughs> that would be nuts. He would just be having a blast with that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a perfect scene for him, I think. I mean, that really would be quite fun. Right. <laughs> yeah, so, so um, you know, I did I did have this notion. Now, here's here's something I've been hearing. So uh, tell me what you think of this. Sure. Um, because I was a movie writer in, in the movie business for a long time, sometimes people read my books and go, oh, well, you know, it's full of action because she's a movie writer. And, and then it's not – and then I'm thinking, well, no. No, no, it's not really. And I – although I just – you know, sounded like it when I said that a minute ago. But the fact is, there's tons of action in Conan Doyle. Oh, of course. It, there's tons of it. And there's not, it, you know, it's just that he wrote short stories. So that usually, like, there's one moment of action. Or not, there's not even in every short story. But when it is, it's usually one time in the story. Uh, and, and, you know, when you write long form, though, you've got, you've, you know, this is a different structure, a different structure you're using. And so you need a different kind of, like, propellant to get you through the three acts, if, you, if you're thinking of it as a three-act right. structure. And so you need you need more um, what big turning points and stuff. So so you know that can be emotional, a big emotional turning point it can be an action, you know, big action sequence. But so but I, I really feel like although I you know have included action in my both my books, I feel like it's still canonical. I just feel like it's still within the range. Well, I'll tell you I, what was I reading? I was reading. Um, oh goodness, I was just I just was. Going back through the um, the man the man with the twisted lip, and oh, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. and Holmes mentions that he boxes. So I mean, okay. there is a ton sure. of implication that there is action going on. It's just that at the time, Doyle yeah. chose to focus in on the um. Int- I'm, it's a bad way of saying it, intellectual aspect of it. And I mean, heck, even basically what you're doing is another version of, I'm going to be careful how I say this, you're doing another version of The Hound of the Baskervilles. Meaning that Doyle and um, Watson and uh, Holmes, there was plenty of action with that. I mean, because the thing is that Hound of the Baskervilles, and this is why I say that, Hound of the Baskervilles was longer than a short story. Unquiet Spirits and Art in the Blood are longer than short stories. So you need to have that. And even Doyle had action in there. I mean, in um, Hound of the Baskervilles, uh, Watson almost blew off Sherlock's brains before he realized that it was Sherlock that was hiding I, in there. Also, Sherlock, he almost falls into the, he gets, he falls into the quicksand and they pull him out. And I, that's just a quick moment on the page, but there's a great Sydney Paget illustration of that. And I mean, and then of course the dog, I mean, they nearly get killed by this dog. And and there's, you know, several times there's, there's near death experiences. And plus he's yeah. camping out, you know, in the, in this little uh, cave-like thing and he's you know there's all kinds of stuff and if you actually look through canon though sometimes Conan Doyle will put it what I would call off stage so he'll say so for example uh and there's a line in I forget which story where he says um uh the other guy went home in a cart <laughs> yeah so, so Holmes has just had a fight with somebody and he comes home and he has a cut and Watson is like tending to the cut and he says something about the other guy went home in a cart. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you don't see the fight on stage or on the page, but it happened. And then Holmes says in another one, somebody knocked his tooth out at Waterloo, I believe, at Waterloo Station. He got a tooth knocked out. and then, so, another, Or maybe it was Victoria, I can't remember. And then uh, you know, there's lots of action. And another time, there two guys leap on him and nearly strangle him until Watson and this other guy come 
ha- save him. And, you know, he's, you know, he's beating off poisonous snakes. And, you know, I mean, he's just, yeah. Well, I'll go back to the Augustus Milverton yeah. case. I mean, him and Watson stood stood in, um, him and Watson were hiding in the, hiding yeah. behind the curtains. And then I the know. lady comes in, shoots Milverton. And yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. assuming people have read it. And the yeah. whole there's a that's that's probably one of the biggest action sequences in all in the canon is the two of them trying to escape from the house after that occurred. There's so much. There's really a lot of action. Even if you just pull a bunch, I did this for a talk I gave. I pulled a bunch of uh, Sydney Paget illustrations and I put them all up together. And it's like you know, tell me there's not action in the canon because <laughs> look at all this this stuff. So you know, the fact is there there is, and so uh, so the, the, again, once again, for me in in my books, um, one of the things I you know because they're long form, um, you know, and there needs to be some excitement, and they are the adventures of Sherlock Holmes, not the mysteries of Sherlock Holmes. That's what you yeah. know, adventures of, and you know, I I think in a way he originally saw these as you know boys' books, like for yeah. you know teenage boys, I guess. But in fact, everybody loves that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Everybody, you know, kids younger than that, and and certainly women, everybody loves them. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, and, and then also, let me add this to it. Um, let's bring up the five pips. Um, yeah. The, the 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 guy that comes in and says, "Hey, Sherlock, I think something's happening to my family." Sherlock says, "Don't worry, it'll be okay. Just put this up yeah. there, and then everything will be fine." And then this the next is, day. Oh, I know. This is a big failure of his. Yeah, and then he was fired up, and you know, like, and it was like the way that like Watson described what he did to the orange, uh, it, like Holmes just came in and just ripped that thing apart. There was no like, let me just pull this piece of the peel off. No, why? Like Holmes was like, I want the pips because I want to send it to these jerks that killed this poor man and. Uh, and make sure that they know that I'm coming for them. And had their ship not sank, then Holmes probably would have done something, type of thing. Well, so, you know, he's it. What's that brings up another interesting uh, idea, Don, and that is that Holmes is, you know, he's a paragon of logic. He's he's you know, he's a man, a rational man, and yet beside and underneath all of this is a really emotional person. Oh yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think that you know what that kind of reminds me of is is that. Um, have you seen the modern Star Trek mo- uh, Kirk movies with Zachary Quinto yes, yes. and Spock? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, well, one of the remarks that in the, it was in the second movie when when Spock said that um, it wasn't that like or like a horror says, well, you're about to die and you didn't care. And he said, oh, on the contrary, the reason why I was quiet was because I care too hard. And it's that type of thing. Yeah. yeah, well, Spock is very similar to to uh, to Holmes that he presents as you know just straight logic, but but yeah, but of course Spock is half human, right? And exactly, and so they, the... they play that, you know. So, so so you know he does have this very emotional uh, side, but he has to keep it under wraps because it was so not appropriate in his culture where he grew up. Right. So exactly. You, or you know, it was too of... overwhelming for him to feel, and I think yeah, yeah. there may be a level of that with Holmes, where Holmes like I think if. So. If Holmes had like you know Holmes falls in love with a woman and he breaks up, I don't think he could handle that. I mean, to an to an extent, um, his drug use is how I'm going to put it. Is it's him escaping from the fact that he's like bored, and he doesn't handle. I don't think he handles feelings very well. Um, I think if you were to actually like if if Doyle had continued with the novels and the stories and say he killed off um, and say he killed off uh, Watson, I think he, there would have been a couple of stories where where Holmes probably would have just checked himself into an opium den and just stayed there for as long as he could because he couldn't feel the pain and the loss of Watson. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely uh you know, I think he wouldn't. He would be pretty much lost without without Watson. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my sense is that you know, because in the canon he uses um, it, cocaine is the one that's most referred to is the seven percent solution he injects of cocaine. That's a stimulant though, I and mean, he also uses morphine. It's it's mentioned in passing, although they don't like it's not on stage again. Right. So it's mentioned in passing, but morphine is a sedative. So he, you know, my theory is that he's uh, bipolar. 
and um, and really it's you know really uncomfortable so you know when he's manic and he doesn't have a case he would probably you know do morphine and when he's you know depressed he would do cocaine uh -huh. so um, you know I think he you know he would have to kind of um, you know, he's he's basically self-medicating uh, a, a situation that wasn't you know diagnosable back then. And, right. I mean, that, that's kind of you know. But Conan Doyle was very, um, you know, as a doctor, he was very very up on stuff. Yes. <laughs> and and uh, you know, he he had a, he also just had a very great understanding of human nature. I think. Yeah, he really did, and that was one of the reasons why, like. Like, again, uh, the, the epitome of what was so great about Conan Doyle is, again, that whole... Like, when he received the letter from the um, man that was accused of uh, mutilating Adul all the farm... I don't know how to pronounce it. Adalji or Adalji yeah. or... Yeah, that guy, yeah. Yeah, the guy who was accused of uh, hurting um, animals and all kinds of stuff. Right. Yeah. And, um, and basically, what he basically did was he came in and said, it can't be this guy. And he more or less yeah. said, if you guys even, and he said to the local police, he's like, if you guys were as smart as you claimed you would, you could even see this. The guy can't read. How in the world can you have a guy mutilating animals at like one in the morning if he can barely see on the light of day? So, <laughs> um, yeah, I know. It's just, yeah, it's interesting how he, yeah. yeah. It, yep. really, it really is. Yep. Really is. Um, Bonnie, we are so thrilled that we have had you today. This conversation has gone on longer than um, than uh, we expected it to, and I am like really thrilled because this was an absolutely great conversation today. Well, it was quite fun to talk to you, Don. And it's, uh, it's always fun to talk Sherlock. <laughs> it really is. And if people want to get a copy of your book or find out more about what you're up to, they can go to mcbird.com. And, yeah, uh, it's and M-A-C-B-I-R-D. It's www.mcbird.com. And I have a book tour coming up. Um, so I don't know when you're going to air this, but my book tour is all through October. I'm going to uh, 10 cities. So, um, uh, and the where I'm going to be is is listed on the at the bottom of the front page of the website. Yes, I am looking at it now. You are going to be in. Let's be very quick. Toronto, Houston, Scottsdale, Forest Park, and Zionsville, and you're actually going to be in my neck of the woods on October 27th in Philadelphia. Yay. So All that's right. yeah. So that's close to where I am. And um, would you trust me? I am going to read something at the end of your book that is in here for people, for fans that will love this. Ahem. For annotations with interesting facts about people, places, and things in this novel, Unquiet Spirits, visit mcbird.com backslash unquiet dash spirits dash notes. Yeah, and if you just if you just go to my website, you can wend your way to that from the front page. You can find it. Exactly. And, yeah, the annotations are a lot of fun. <laughs> they are fun. It talks about some of the research and some photos and stuff like that. Yeah. So, and, and let me ask this: Is your next book going to be the Sherlock Holmes, the Ice Cream Adventure, or Sherlock Holmes, the Chocolate <laughs> <okay>. Adventure? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, it's going to be the Devil's Due. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> so, keeping with that paranormal thing going. Well, uh, something like that. Maybe yeah. not. Maybe yeah. not paranormal, but certainly moral. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to say that whole spirit, demon, spirit yeah. thing. Yeah, so. it could be. could be. Yeah. <laughs> well, Bonnie, yeah. Bonnie, yeah. Bonnie, we are so thrilled to have you again. Thank you so much for being John, here. John, thank you. It's a great pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, okay. And everybody, thank you so much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation. And take care and have a great day.